To him, even silence is praise. For in him was created the universe of things, both in the heavenly realm and on the earth. All that is seen and unseen, he is the divine portrait, the true likeness of the invisible God. He rides across the heavens to help you, across the skies in majestic splendor. For he is the one all of humanity comes before with amazing wonders and with awe-inspiring displays of power. Everyone, everywhere, looks to him. For he is the confidence of all the earth. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and most importantly, from wherever you are at in the globe, or whenever you are viewing this service, welcome to Union Church of Manila, a congregation that is united, centered, and maturing in Christ. I'm Pastor Chad, I'm the senior pastor of UCM, and we are so delighted that you've chosen to worship with us this morning, and we pray that you will be both encouraged and edified during our time together. But before we begin our time of worship and instruction, I would like to make the UCM community aware of a couple of items uh, that are unfolding right now. Number one, the UCM campus is completely closed this week for disinfection. As you can see, I'm here back at Fort Williams sharing with you. Our campus operations are scheduled to resume again this Friday, July 24th at 10 a.m. So we should be back to recording on campus for next Sunday service. You know, life during COVID is always an adventure, and UCM is trying to be diligent in keeping the staff and the community safe. So please bear with us this week. But as a result in this pause of operations, our check pickup service uh, for your offerings has also been postponed to July or, uh, 24th, this upcoming Friday. So if you were planning to have that pickup service come out and pick up your check, I, I would just encourage you to set that check aside and uh, we will be happy to pick it up uh, from you on the 24th, this upcoming Friday. You can also drop your offering off at, or your pledges off at UCM at any time at the RADA entrance. The guards will be there and they'll be happy to assist you with a box that's been placed in the foyer for those who would like to physically give or physically drop off their, their pledges or their giving. Keep in mind that there are also a number of other ways that you can give. You can go to the website for further details or take a screenshot right now of the information that's being placed up on the screen. We, we just encourage you to be faithful and generous in your giving out of what God has provided for you. We know that some of the methods of giving right now are a bit more challenging than simply dropping it off in the plate, but your giving deeply impacts UCM ministry, staff, and our struggling missions partners. Speaking of the struggling missions partners, uh, many of you are familiar with our moments and missions uh, during our worship service on campus. Since the lockdown, we have put this on hold as a result of um, our reorganization of our online service. But last month, we brought it back and are continuing with it with the virtual version of it so that our partner missions organizations will be, continue, uh, be able to continue to share their story on how your generous hearts have helped them to further advance the kingdom of God. Today's mission partner is Christian Partnership for Confined Ministry. I would encourage you, they, they've sent in a, a video uh, sharing some of their work with us, uh, so please listen to the work that your giving is supporting. Good morning, Union Church of Manila. My name is Charlie Mendelez. I am the lead pastor of the Christian Partnership for the Confined Ministry. Our church has served in the prison ministry since 2002 in Mindanao and beyond. By the grace of the Lord, I lead a team of 11 part-time ministry volunteers composed of ex-prisoners. We shared the gospel in seven jails and six paid police offices in Cagayan de City on a weekly basis. UCM has been partnering with CPCM since 2016 
in making our prison ministry programs possible. With your help, we were able to add three more new jail ministries within Region 10. Your help provided for our logistic needs when we minister to the inmates in these new jails. By God's amazing grace, 20% of our congregation are ex-prisoners and their families who worship and serve the Lord with us. Four of the top leaders of the notorious gangs in Mindanao prisons who were released are now part of our prison ministry. Two of them became our pastors and now serving in our two daughter churches in Region 10 in Malaybalay and San Simon. Many of our ex-prisoners are now employed in establishment run by Christian businessmen. We praise God for the witness as they are also leading Bible studies inside the workplace. It is inspiring to witness how the lives transformed inside the prisons are now also transforming lives outside the prisons. All praises and glory to God and His amazing grace. When this coronavirus crisis situation improves, we hope you can visit us here in Cagayan de Oro City to witness how God transformed the lives of the prisoners and their families. As the Lord permits, Perhaps our, your volunteers can help us serve through livelihood training programs for the in-prison and out-of-prison programs. Thank you, Union Church of Manila, for your faithful partnership in prayers and general support for the ministry to, risk, to reach the less and the lost people in the prisons, that they may know and experience our Lord Jesus Christ and find true freedom in Him alone. Our gratitude and all praises to God. Thank you and God bless you. One last item. Some have been inquiring about the IATF's position on 10% uh, church reopening. Well, despite this position on the church reopening, we are still in a holding pattern until we are absolutely certain that we can safely manage a reopening. Council and staff is actively discussing and preparing for that time when it comes. As you know, there are many safety concerns and we want to be diligent in addressing as many of them as possible. All of this to say that we do not foresee a 10% opening at UCM over the next few weeks. But stay tuned, and we ask you to continue to connect to the UCM community in whatever way that you can. And we will let you know in the next couple of weeks the way forward and the plans that we have worked out in this ever-changing flux of restrictions and regulations. Please join me in prayer as we enter into our time of worship. Lord, we come today, we offer our hearts to you, we offer our praise to you, we lift our voices to you, we, Lord, desire to honor you through the singing of songs, through the confession of creed, and through the proclamation of scripture. Lord, be honored in this service online as we are all gathered in different places in different parts of the world, Lord. Cover your church with your protection and your guidance in these days. And we ask this in your name. Amen.
Scripture reading today is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have sent your son to die for us, that we may be reconciled to you in every way. What good news that is. And Father God, I ask that wherever each and every person is this moment, wherever they are tuning in from, I pray that you would impress upon their heart a fresh knowledge, a fresh knowing, a fresh awareness of your presence and also of your goodness, Lord. We know, Father, that throughout the ages there have been troubled times. You said it would be so in your word, that we would experience troubles and tribulations and all kinds of trials in this world. That is now. But, Father, you also called us not to forget that you are a good and loving God. 
You have called us not to forget that we have indeed been called out of darkness and into your glorious light. So we thank you that we are in the light, even though what we see is dark, we are in the light. We are in your light and we are in your life. We thank you for that, Lord. And Jesus, I thank you that you remind us of your truths by the power of your Holy Spirit. So remind us today of what we needed to need to be reminded of in these dark times. We thank you for your truth, Lord God. And Father, we lift up all around the world who are experiencing suffering, who are experiencing sickness, Lord, and who need your healing. So Jehovah Rapha, we ask that you would indeed bring forth your healing in the physical body of those suffering from COVID-19 right now. We pray for healing in the physical bodies. Lord, we pray for healing in our hearts, in our souls, in our minds. Jehovah Rapha, we call on you this morning and we thank you that Jesus, because of what you did on the cross, we can ask and we can believe you for complete and total healing. And Father, we also ask for your provision. We call upon Jehovah Jireh, our provider God, that so many of us are going through difficult times financially, Lord, that we need to call upon you and believe that you are the God of multiplication, that even with the loaves and the fish that the little boy brought to you, you multiplied it and you fed thousands upon thousands. So we ask Jehovah Jireh for you to bring provision to those listening right now in the material way. Bring the next meal, Lord. Work through your people to provide for your people, we pray. And God, we lift up all the leaders in the world who are facing difficult decisions, very difficult decisions, whether to open, whether to stay closed, whether to continue the lockdown. Lord, there's so many difficult decisions. So we pray for our leaders in governments making difficult decisions. We pray for our leaders of churches, our pastors who are making difficult decisions, leaders of businesses who are making difficult decisions. And we pray for wisdom straight from heaven, that you would rain down your wisdom, not wisdom of man, but wisdom from heaven. And we specifically pray over Pastor Chad and Pastor Noah and the entire ministry team of UCM. We pray that you would give them the exact wisdom that they need to, to continue leading this flock in this time. God, we thank you for our church and we thank you that we have this family here to encourage each other during this time. And now let us pray as our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us join together and recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. The third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <laughs>
Hello Union Church of Manila and anyone tuning in during this time for this service of worship of Union Church. I am Pastor Noah. I am here in my home uh, where we call Camp Kennedy. As you can see, I'm here and I have the, uh, the white curtains as the backdrop here, which are appropriate for today, I believe, as I sort of imagine uh, these uh, the, kind of the white curtains with the light behind me coming forward. I imagine this is a uh, symbolic uh, sort of as, uh, you know, if you will, at uh, the heavenly places, while also sort of heavenly places within the confines of practical life right now in the quarantine as we continue through the Colossians hymn, where indeed it is packed with both uh, like lofty truths of Jesus Christ, who is over everything, uh, while at the same time, right now with us. This passage we've been in for the sermon series is regarded as the most famous passage in Colossians, and one of the high points overall of, the, of understanding uh, Christ in the New Testament. The two verses that we're going to be in today are the culmination of the passage and will graduate us from this sermon series in Colossians. Our passage and hymn is located right here at the crux of the Colossians letter, and it forms a basis uh, from which to read the rest of the letter. Uh, which I highly encourage you to read or reread again uh, this week. You'll finish the first chapter, and then there are only three more chapters to follow. Uh, it will see, certainly be worth your time, even if you have to skip breakfast or skip a meal to do it. Uh, I came across a talk by uh, Pastor John Piper this week, and I was really encouraged by his passion and enthusiasm to really exhort people to read their Bible every day, to resolve to read it every day. And it's just something I believe we need to hear, and especially from a passionate person like him, it really got to me. He says that the reason most people are, um, or excuse that, you know, are, we're not able to read our Bible each day is because, well, we don't have enough time. And understandably, we can all appreciate that. But his argument is to say, well, if you have enough time to eat, you have enough time to read your Bible. So if you must, skip a meal and read your Bible. <laughs> so probably you won't have to do that. Uh, most of us have more time on our hands than, than we have had. And in the past, and so um, just really encourage you to read the rest of Colossians following this passage. Again, it will be well worth it, well worth it, well worth it. I've loved spending time in this letter this past week. So just a recap of the prior two Sundays. Uh, the prior two Sundays, essentially, we saw how Jesus is Lord of creation. And today, we are going to see how Jesus is Lord of reconciliation. And we're going to zoom in on that word, reconcile. You know, it's a word that we hear, but we're going to look at it anew. And we're, try, we're going to try to get into the intention of the author, both human and divine here. And we're going to try to get into the reality and biblical experience of that word and trust that God will impart to us an insight or deed uh, in both our individual lives and our collective lives together, even while we are apart one from another. You know, God, Jesus is over everything, and a God that is over everything, I believe, can have such an effect on us as individuals, but also as a collective church, even while we are apart one from another. So we'll go into the text with high expectation that God is going to meet us and give us an insight or impress um, a, a deed upon our heart uh, today. We'll see in this passage, as we zoom in on two verses, the fullness of Christ. We've learned about the past two weeks, as Pastor Chad has expounded that to us. We'll see the fullness of Christ 
sort of in the lofty, almost incomprehensible truths of Christ that we've learned about. We're going to see those kind of come down a bit to meet us here on earth where the rubber touches the road and where the actual blood of Jesus was shed on the cross. And we're going to see how the, the actual blood of Jesus shed on the cross is really sort of the culminating emphasis um, for us in this passage and what that means for, uh, for us. And as good as we saw that Jesus is in previous weeks, things are going to get even more real in the two verses today as these lofty, as I said, these lofty and somewhat incomprehensible truths of who Jesus is, they do touch down and hit home a bit more personally with us today. Before we turn to our passage, before we go to our text and hear it read aloud, will you pray with me? Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the new day that you have made. We thank you for the chance once more to gather as a church all across the region, the city, in homes and living rooms and dwelling places, or all across this nation and even in, in, in other countries, to, to come now to this time of worship. I pray that you would help us to, to settle in and now to really hear from you through your word. Lord, through your word, would you help us to see what we need to see today? Bring us comfort where we need it. Bring us challenge where we need it. Come, Lord, may the fullness of your presence be with us and help us to hear from you uh, this in this time. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Here is... Uh, verses 15 to 20 at 1 Colossians. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all the fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. This is the word of God for us today. Turning now to verse 19, we'll take, we'll take it one verse at a time. Uh, reading again verse 19, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Here, all the fullness refers to the fullness of God we heard about expounded in the previous four verses over the previous two weeks. And just to recap those again, what we learned there was Jesus is the visible image of God. He is the greatest thing in creation. He is the creator of all things. Jesus is eternal. Jesus is holding all things together. He is the head of the church and has authority over death. And God, the Father, is pleased, the text says, it is his pleasure to have all his fullness, his strength, his majesty, his supremacy, 
as well as his kindness, his humility, and goodness. He's pleased to have the fullness of those things, those characteristics, come together and to dwell in Jesus Christ. And what do we mean there by dwell? Dwell meaning that that fullness of God, his full complement is located inside Jesus. His fullness settles down in Jesus, sort of makes its home living inside as if a permanent resident inside one's personal home. That is the fullness of God that is dwelling and was dwelling in Jesus Christ. Take a look at this image. The Royal Clipper sail ship built in 1902 is regarded to be the world's largest sailing ship with five masts that are rigged fully. On and inside the Royal Clipper, there is no more room for any additional mast or sails. Full of sailors and sails filled out at full wind capacity, the Royal Clipper here displays its full fullness at sea. So the idea here is of God's fullness. God's full divine complement did dwell in the human vessel of Jesus Christ. Elsewhere in the scripture, we see the teaching at Colossians 2.9. It says, for in Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And I love these concise words of the 17th century preacher and poet John Donne that somehow capture this point just so, where he says these words and he uses this poetic language. He says, "'Twas much that man was made like God before. Man was made like God as in the man of Adam, but that God should be like man much more, meaning that God should be like man in Christ that is much more. Now, why is this point of the fullness of God dwelling in Jesus a crucial point for the Colossian believers to understand? Why is it here in this hymn and why this emphasis on the fullness of God dwelling in Jesus in human form? What is so important there for us to grasp? What was important for the Colossians to grasp? What is important for us to grasp? Now, to understand this, uh, we need to get into the mindset a little bit of ancient Greek, uh, the ancient Greek mindset. The ancient Greek mindset typically took a negative view of all things physical and bodily in a culture that most prized the more spiritual realm of ideas and the mind, the body just, it just kind of seemed to be a letdown. It wasn't as lofty. It wasn't as sort of um, uh, regarded. The body was kind of, uh, you know, second rate and people didn't sort of value the body as much. The human body in that mindset, as one commentator puts it, has an irritating tendency to embarrass us with its uncontrollable smells, sounds, and emissions. That is before we even consider our flaws and limits, especially as we get older and weaker and eventually grind to a halt altogether when we breathe our last breath. It can hardly seem a glorious story when the body is involved. Surely, it is better to think deep, profound, and beautiful lofty thoughts and encourage everyone to do the same. But no, that is not God's style. Why does it matter to the people at Colossae and to us today, right now, that the fullness of God lived in his son as a human being. It matters 
because it is critical to understand that these lofty and somewhat incomprehensible concepts we know about Jesus, they are not just out there ethereal feel-good descriptions about a once blessed and good moral teacher. Uh, that is not what that, that is about. That is, they're not just, just feel-good notions uh, that are good to consider from time to time. The truth that the fullness of God lived in a human being is important because of what God did through the divine and human being of Jesus on that cross. God demonstrated to all people of all time in a way that we could relate that God so loved his creation that he gave his one and only son on the cross. That's John uh, 3.16. God so loved the world, God so loved the creation that he gave his one and only, there was only one, one son. He gave him up on the cross. Jesus wasn't just a nice to have for God as he was becoming so to some of the people at Colossae, and as he can become to us today. For God, Jesus was a must-have. Jesus was his one and only son, and he was the vessel in which the fullness of God did dwell. See, the hymn in, here, in, here in the letter to Colossians, it's getting at some of the belief in the day where Jesus was getting relegated as sort of a, a nice to have uh, sort of uh, part of my belief in some bigger experience of God. He was getting into this sort of relegated place. But the, what the hymn is bring, bringing us back to is that Jesus is central. Jesus is vital. Jesus is unique. Jesus is of ultimate port importance. So what the people of Colossae needed to learn then, we need to learn and grasp again today. I need to reawaken to the fact that for God and me, Jesus is of ultimate importance. I need to reawaken to the fact that for God and for me, Jesus is of ultimate importance. Now let's look at verse 20, rereading verse 19 and flowing into 20. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things. Now the meaning of the word reconcile here, it means to change completely, to kind of bring back to a former state that it was intended to be in, a former state of rightness or harmony. Harmony means agreement or accord. Uh, it is a consistent, orderly, or pleasing arrangement of parts. And for all of the people uh, watching that appreciate music, in music, you know that harmony is the simultaneous sort of combination of tones and practical combination of chords that make music pleasing to our ears. Now the scripture implies here that it is Jesus that makes possible the harmony of all created things, including you and me, which implies that without Jesus, somehow, if Jesus is missing from the equation, I am not in the right state or in harmony with God. So through Jesus, the scripture says, God reconciles to himself all things, making it possible for me to be brought back to a former state of harmony. Again, without Jesus, Something in my world is off key. Now, what is all this about? What is this about? Some of the staff of the church 
like to joke with me in my singing that I am harmonically challenged. Maybe it's not really a joke. In the past, when I have sung loud enough to be heard, apparently I was not in harmony with the music or with the people around me. And one former pastor of Union Church that we know well, in fact, used to give me, even during our services of worship, he used to give me the cut it out gesture, something is not right with your singing. When I sang, something is not right was the gesture. It meant basically something is not right in me when I sing. Something is fundamentally not right inside that it would produce what it is producing. Now, when we look to the scripture in Romans, we learn about this state of something not being right in the tone, if you will, of our life. Something not being right in the tone of our life. Something is missing. Something is in need of change, in need of harmony, in need of being made right. Let's look at these verses in Romans. Reading it, Romans 1, verses 12 to 14, it says, you know the story of how Adam landed us in the dilemma we're in. First sin, then death, and no one exempt from either sin or death. That sin disturbed relations with God in everything and everyone. But the extent of the disturbance was not clear until God spelled it out in detail to Moses. So death, this huge abyss separating us from God, dominated the landscape from Adam to Moses. Even those who didn't sin precisely as Adam did by disobeying a specific command of God still had to experience this termination of life, this separation from God. But Adam, who got us into this, also points ahead to the one who will get us out of it. And four chapters later, we see the universal, four, the universal fourfold need of humanity. Reading again here at Romans 5. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, meaning we lacked strength, Christ died for us. Christ died for the ungodly, meaning we lacked merit before God. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were sinners, while we lacked righteousness, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, meaning being at odds with God because of sin, we lack peace. While we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life. So from this sort of fourfold status report before God, without Christ, the one and only, it is clear that we are not able to save ourselves from the wrong in our lives. We are not able to accomplish our own reconciliation, to forgive ourselves of sin and we are not able to accomplish what it takes to be made right in relationship to God. But because Jesus, the one and only, knows the truth about us before we knew him, he knew that something is not right here. 
He knows every time we have done something wrong we shouldn't have. He knows every way in which we may consider him a nice to have and have not sought him as a must have. And he knows every way in which we are against him and where we continue to struggle to place him in the place of ultimate importance in our hearts and lives. Yet God does not hold this over our heads. He allowed it to be held over his own head in Christ. Jesus, the one and only Lord of creation, is also the one and only Lord of reconciliation. God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to set aside his power in order to love and to serve, to reconcile to himself all things, including you, including me, through his blood shed on the cross, says the scripture, so that we may have the chance to be changed completely brought back to a former state of harmony, fully alive before God and with God. Friends, this is the good news of the gospel. Hallelujah, hallelujah. For those that choose to put their trust and faith in Jesus Christ and follow the way of Jesus, ever being renewed and assured in that state of knowing your life song is pleasing to God's ears, well, there is just no freedom and feeling like it. To illustrate this point, I want to read a transcript uh, from a video that I discovered in a book that I'm reading called Jesus Among Secular Gods by Ravi Zacharias and Vince Vitale. And you'll now have to dial in to listen carefully uh, to absorb the impact of this story. The video transcript is of two daughters on Mother's Day who alternate uh, holding up index cards in order to tell the story of their mother's love for them. Here is the transcript of what those cards said. I'm Chloe and I'm Annie. We want to tell you a story about our mom. Our mom and dad got married in 1991. In 1992, I was born. That's Chloe. A few years later, in 1994, I was born, that's Annie. And finally, in 1996, our little brother was born. We lived in a happy home with lots of love and laughter, and a mom who loved us more than the world. But there was an accident in 1999 that changed everything. We were on vacation with my grandparents, and we were going to rent a log cabin. It was a beautiful and, overlo and overlooked a huge cliff. We were so excited. At the time, I was seven. I was five, our, and our brother was three. When we pulled into the driveway of the house, my parents and grandparents got out of the car to sign paperwork in the doorway. My sister, brother, and I stayed in the car and watched from the window. Even though my mom had her keys with her, the car somehow knocked out of gear and started rolling toward the cliff. As soon as my mom saw what was happening, she did the unthinkable. She ran in front of the car 
determined to stop it. We remember the look on her face right before she went under. And we remember feeling the bump as we ran over her body. That bump saved our lives. It slowed the car down just enough for my grandpa to run up beside it and pull the emergency brake right before we went over the cliff. The weight of the car on my mother's body should have killed her, but by some miracle of miracles, it didn't, but it did break her back. She is paralyzed from the waist down and she will never walk again. But she says she wouldn't change it for the world because her three kids are alive and with her. She hasn't let her wheelchair stop her from anything. She has been at every piano recital, every tennis tournament, and is the voice at the end of the phone when I'm away at college. She is our rock and our best friend. She is the most amazing mother in the world. She taught us from a young age that when people stare at us because of her wheelchair, we should hold our head up high and just stare back. That is what she has done with life. Life gave her a tough hand of cards, but she arranged them into something beautiful. Yes, she saved our lives in the accident in 1999. But she saves them over and over again, each and every day. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. We love you more than words. Now the mom said here that she wouldn't change what happened for the world because her three kids are alive and with her. And I tend to think that that is how God views things with us. At a high cost to himself, through Jesus, all things were reconciled to God. And we may be fully alive in a relationship with God, not unlike that parent to child, child to parent, kind of relationship, where on any given Sunday or any day of the week, we may say with similar feeling as those two children to their self-giving parent, happy Sunday, God, we too love you more than words. What peace he makes possible for us. What harmony is available through what was done in Jesus' shed blood on the cross? God has made peace for you through His blood in Jesus shed on the cross. But have you accepted it? Do you have harmony in the key relationship and the key relationships in your life? Do you have the assurance that you are right before God? He will not force it upon you. I need to accept God's offer of peace in Jesus Christ. I need to offer, I need to accept God's offer of peace in Jesus Christ. And if you would like to accept that offer of God's peace in Christ, let me say a prayer and you can pray along with me. It is a simple prayer sorry, thank you, and please that you can join me and pray this prayer right now and accept God's offer of peace in Jesus Christ. Dear God, I'm sorry 
for the wrong in my life. I am sorry for the sin in my life that has been there. And I thank you that through Jesus Christ, you do reconcile to yourself all things, and that includes me. Thank you for what Jesus did on the cross. Thank you for the chance at the forgiveness of my sins. Would you help me in this prayer realize truly that through this confession, through this belief, by you, I have forgiveness of sin. Thank you that you reconcile my life to yourself. Thank you that I may have peace through what you did by shedding of your by the shedding of your blood on the cross. Thank you, Lord, that I may now be rightly restored in a relationship with you, in a relationship with others and have peace. Thank you so much. In your name I pray and give thanks. Amen. To bring the sermon series to a close, I want to share the lyrics of a favorite hymn that I think aligns just so with the hymn in Colossians and in this message in particular. It's a hymn that's always seem to find me and and that I that I hear just at the right time when I need it. And it did so this week as I prayed and reflected on the scripture for this message today. This hymn helps me remember and absorb that peace and that assurance that even though Jesus is over everything. At the same time, He cares very much about everything, including you and me. He cared enough to shed His blood on the cross to make possible this peace this harmony with him and in the relationships in the relationships of our lives the hymn some of you know it is called there is a bomb in gilead there is a balm in gilead a balm is an ointment or medicine used to heal and soothe And Gilead was a mountainous region east of the Jordan River, situated in modern-day Jordan. In Jeremiah 8, in the Old Testament, Israel was in exile, in a state of displacement. And the Babylonian enemy was to invade and violate their holy places and way of life. The people of God were in a state of great confusion and uncertainty. It's a most desperate and despondent time in Israel's history. Then the chapter ends with these two rhetorical questions. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? to help bring healing and soothing to the people of God in such desperation. To to understand the hymn through the lens of the New Testament, the shed blood of Christ on the cross is the balm in Gilead. His spirit is the supreme physician all sufficient so that the people may be healed and soothed knowing the peace and harmony that only the Lord of creation the Lord of reconciliation the one the 
only Son of God, Jesus Christ, can bring. Now I am going to sing, There is a balm in Gilead. I invite you, if you know the lyrics, to join me and to sing with me. There is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin sick soul. Sometimes I feel discouraged and think my works in vain but then the Holy Spirit revives my soul again there is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin sick soul. If you cannot preach like Peter, if you cannot pray like Paul, you can tell the love of Jesus and say he died for all. There is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin sick soul. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
to die when I come to die give me Jesus give me Jesus Now receive the benediction. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. Have a great week ahead, Union Church. See you again. Greetings to all of you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. My name is Our Love. I serve in the children's ministry. Thank you for joining us in today's worship service. I would like to share with you several ways on keeping connected and involved with the UCM community. Let's be ready for emergencies, especially in this time of the pandemic. Join this webinar on August 1 that talks about COVID-19, as well as other threats to our health and safety that we need to prepare for, like disasters and natural calamities. You are invited to join us for the Midweek Essentials, a time of spiritual nourishment with scriptural reflection, songs, and prayer. Published on Wednesdays on the UCM website and the UCM channels on YouTube, and Vimeo. There is help and encouragement after the death of a family member or a friend. Be part of the 13-week Grief Share Seminar to begin on July 20. Email carecoordinator at unionchurch.ph for inquiries or to sign up. Each year, the Nominations Committee recommends candidates to the Council to replace outgoing council and nominations committee members. If you know of anyone who is willing to serve, please let the nominations committee know by just filling out a form found on the nominations page at the UCM website. We will be happy to hear from you and pray with you and for you. If you need prayer for any reason, please email us at ucmcares at unionchurch.ph You may also like to give and help us support our brothers and sisters in need. Should you also want to make an offering or continue with your pledge, online giving is available. You may also drop off your giving at UCM anytime. We also added ways on how to give while you are at home. Please visit the website for more information. In this time of crisis, let us hold fast to Jesus, our source of strength, who is all things, and in Him all things hold together. Thank you, and God bless.